Hello, hello, good morning, bonjour, buenos dias, welcome in, aloha, namaste, assalamu alaikum, hey y'all, good morning, welcome to Mobile Metron, coming to you live from atop my roof, and it was super windy when I came up here and I asked the wind to die down, and it has, now it's actually kind of warm, so I hope, hey Stephanie. I hope, uh, hope it doesn't get too hot up here for the phone. Yeah, it's starting to already do that. Hang on, let me get in the shade. Sometimes when this iPhone gets too warm, it starts um, shutting down and I can't see it and it's already doing that. Hang on, let me think what I should do. I mean, I can just barely make out. I'm just gonna believe it's gonna come back up. Dear iPhone, please cool down and come back up so I can see. Um, I'm just going to believe that's going to work out. I see people are on here, but I can't. <laughs> I see men as trees walking. I might. I mean, I may need to go inside. Hang on, let me think about it. Um. I don't like to talk when I can't see you. Um, hmm. Hang on, let me... How about I make you dizzy moving? Let me, let me try this. See if that's any better. Now it's super dark. <laughs> Hang on, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's see if this is better. Actually, that is better. Okay. All right, now at least I can see the people are on here. Okay. Your... Yeah, I am. I, yeah, I'm trying to understand what you're saying. Um, good morning, everybody. Sorry, this is so professional I might should have stayed inside uh, you know what let me think sorry I I was up here in plenty of time to get this ready but I didn't know it was gonna get so warm when I asked the wind to die down I didn't realize it was gonna heat up so quickly maybe this will be okay is it too windy if it's too windy I'll go is that okay, Ken? You can you can see and hear me okay? Cause it's it's too windy. I need to come downstairs. Um, all right, if you can see, cause I can. All right, I can now. I can start to see you. Um, you're coming back up now. Okay, good. I look great. Well, as long as I look great, that's what really matters. Um, hold that thought. the shadow I need to put my jacket back on okay oh, is that how okay I can just barely see that. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy it's like when the iPhone gets hot it starts dimming down and you can just barely make out the letters so it's like a mystery but I believe you're all saying wonderfully good things and that it's gonna come this uh, Hang on, let me see if I can do that. I'm not disconnected. Okay, that made a huge difference. Now I can see you. Okay, woo. Uh, oh, much better. Okay, I'm, I'm good. We're good to go now. Hello, 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 who everybody's on here. Thank you for uh, bearing with me while I found the right uh, place. Uh, yeah, it actually started yesterday, Rhonda. It looks like they had a good turnout for everybody. I'm, I, I'm gonna go tomorrow morning and vote. Hey, Michael. Hey, Howie. Hey, Rhonda. Hey, Lisa. Hey, Jeanette. Jeanette says I'm good. Okay, good. See, everything's all right. How's everybody doing this morning? Hope everybody had an ex uh, excellent Thanksgiving. We certainly did. 
I think you probably saw our pictures. Thursday night we uh, were over at Mom's house, and Debbie and Shannon and Mr. Bo came over, and that was good. Hey, Elwood. And um, then Friday night, I mean, yeah, Friday night we went to, uh, hey, Valerie, hey, Leslie. I'm beautiful. Come on, Jesus. Prophesy it, sister. Um, we went out to Ken's niece and her husband's, I guess that makes, what does that make? Is Travis your nephew then? Your niece, his, his niece and nephew. And, uh, oh yeah, well, I'm glad you had it, whatever it was, uh, John. Uh, but we had a, we had a great time and we didn't take as many pictures out at, uh, for Ken's. Hey, Raj. But um, a lot of people were there. He got to see his granddaughter, so that was good. And um, so um, the holidays are here. Let me give you some uh, announcements, and then we'll get into uh, the word I want to share with you. Um, next Sunday, hey, Vicki. Uh, <laughs> See, so there's the traditional Thanksgiving screaming. Why did you, why did you take their debit card, Ed? Uh, well, bless your heart. Be thankful you got a job. That's, that's, I'm trying to see that glass half full for you. Anyway, next Sunday we will be in the theater. Um, we're in the theater first Sundays of every month. Uh, Jonah will be with us, uh, my son Jonah Swilly. Uh, well, y'all pray for Ed. The Ed will get saved today. It's, we've got the I've got the intercessors. They've been praying around the clock, and today may be the day. So Ed'll stop being evil. Um, if you don't know, what he's talking about Ed works for a bank, and he's he's on the uh, he, he's on the phones where people call in to complain about stuff. So, uh, yeah, think of the think of the overtime pay. What Jeanette said. Anyway, hey Fred. Um, so that's next Sunday, December fourth at eleven a.m. Um, I'm really hoping a lot more of you show up than did last. Uh, last month last month kind of messed with my head a little bit but uh i'm believing that was just a, a fluke that everyone decided to disappear on the same day if it happens again next month I, i'm gonna have to reconsider some things but uh, i'm hoping you all remember uh i'm hoping um you all remember how to find your way to the theater because i i do think it's important that we still as much as streaming is convenient for everybody the uh, the personal connection is important as well. So uh, then also on Saturday, December 17th, we'll be having our um, Christmas event at the um, Red Light Cafe. Choreology will be doing, uh, he, him and, he and his band will be there. And um, you can go to bishinthenow.com and just pay a $20 cover fee and that'll uh, help us offset the cost of everything. It's going to be a really good evening. And then we'll be back in the theater the second Sunday of uh, January 2023. Because first Sunday will be New Year's Day. So on January 8th, we'll be back in the theater. Johnny Almanza, the um, cello player, will be back with us that day. And then... Um, the uh, meditation weekend number 17 is coming up uh, later in the month. You can scroll up to my uh, cover photo and see all the information. For that, it's going to be in Helen, Georgia. It's going to be magical. So um, we're expecting a good turnout for that. All right. <clears throat> Let's do some affirmations and then we'll do uh, a little bit of breath work. Um, I am blessed. I am a blessing. I am. That's awesome, Mimi. I'm glad you're coming. Um, I am um, well. I am wellness. 
I am. I am whole. I am wholeness. I am. I am is the highest affirmation. Um, I am free. I am freedom. I am. I am um, healed. I am health. I am. I am um, liberated. I am liberty. I am. Um, I am peaceful. I am peace. I am. I am serene. I am serenity. I am. I am is when we release our divinity out into the atmosphere and we speak that word out and the energy that is on those words create things in the unified quantum field as the creator spoke everything into existence uh, and said let there be light that's how we continue to create our world the same way that he created his worlds we create our world. The same way that Hebrews, the first chapter says, he holds all things together by the word of his power. We hold all things together by the word of our power. Hey, Karen. Um, we're going to do some breath work. Go in through the nose, hold it. Release through the mouth. Uh, hey, Maria. Let's go in. Hold. Exhale. Inhale, exhale, in, out, give me a couple more, inhale, exhale, inhale, exhale, I don't know if any of you saw this thing I shared uh, from Jacob Wright's page was several days ago about the the name for God that's pronounced Yahweh, but it's actually the uh, it's actually meant to be an unpronounceable name because it's supposed to be something that you breathe. It's the the Y W something H. Um, it's not supposed to be pronounceable, and it was really cool what he uh, wrote about when you take your first breath and your last breath, you're really saying the name of God. And I, every time I do a meditation weekend, I always talk about how breath and spirit are used interchangeably in the scriptures. And I, I really believe um, part of my personal ministry of reconciliation is to bring things back into a um, Christian-friendly concept of meditation. Because meditation is, uh, it's a holy thing. It's not exclusively Buddhist or Hindu. Uh, Jesus meditated. Jesus breathed on his disciples. Breath and spirit are all, all together in the scriptures. And I love that when I first introdu introduced it to Metron, everybody just got it. I didn't have to over explain it. I didn't have to defend it. Uh, I just said, this is this is the next level of what we're doing and everybody everybody was into it and now we've done uh, 16 meditation weekends and they've all been just exceeding abundantly above all I could ask or think and I'm sure the 17th is going to be just as great greater so I'm very aware of the presence of God up here on my roof and having done the affirmations and the um, breath work, now I speak into this atmosphere and I say, let there be light. Um, if you were raised in, in like I was, um, even similarly, you probably had some kind of ambivalent feeling about the book of Revelation. Um, when I was growing up in church, anytime 
people taught on the book of Revelation or if we did a series on the Reve on the book of Revelation, there was always this very different vibe about it. It was, um, it was very austere, a lot of fear. Um, the, the emphasis was definitely on the end of the world. Very little about Jesus, a whole lot about an antichrist, a whole lot about um, computers and microchips and 666 and all that kind of stuff. Even um, even when I still worked with my dad, in, in when we were, had all the charismatic superstars in once a month, we had um, we had a man uh, Hilton Sutton came in and he. He taught the entire book of Revelation from the first to the, from chapter one to uh, the last verse in the Bible. And we had, we probably had 1,500, 2,000 people a night that came to this thing. Because people were definitely, and especially this would have been around, um, well, it's before I started Church in the Now, so it would have been before 85. I'm going to say probably around 83, 84, somewhere in there. And um, uh, the, people didn't say it that much, but there was definitely, hey, Natalie, there was definitely um, subliminal um, thought that things were going to wrap up in 1988. I grew up thinking that. I remember uh, my dad had a... Um, prophecy preacher come to our church and he told everybody in no uncertain terms you know that the rapture will take place in 1988 uh he based it on jesus saying that uh to the people in matthew 24 so, there's some of you alive who who there's some of you here who will um still be alive when this happens so he believed that a generation was 40 years and so since Israel became a nation in 1948, the, their conclusion was 40 years from that would be 1988. And um, even in interviews when people would ask me um, when I first came out, they'd say, How, did you ever consider coming out? <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. And I said, no. I, I mean, I remember as a kid sitting on that front row and counting up thinking, well, I won't be here past... 30 so every decision i ever made was always based on my life has a my life on the earth has a um a deadline a, a time limit so anything i'm gonna do i gotta do before i'm 30 and uh <clears throat> so you know once once 1988 came and went uh a lot of a lot of those prophecy preachers pushed it back to the year 2000. Even the other day, I, we were somewhere and they were playing uh, Prince's 1999, and even that song is about the end of the world in the year 2000, because he says, uh, "Tomorrow, 2000, zero, zero, oop, party over, out of time," and uh, he says, "So tonight I'm gonna party like it's 1999." So. Even, even though it wasn't spoken that much, it, there was still this subliminal thought, oh, this is going to happen in the year 2000. And then the year 2000 came and went, and then um, I heard a lot of people, a lot of these guys, these prophecy books, had to, actually had to take them out of print and re- and edit them because they put wrong dates in them. Uh, I don't know how many times the late great planet Earth has been revised. Because it came out in, I think, 1968, and it, like, it's, you can't even find its original, um, original copies of it, because it, it's had, it's been edited so much. <clears throat> um, so then I heard, after 2000, uh, which, none of the prophecy preachers saw 9-11 coming. That was, that always cracked me up. It's like, wow, y'all been... Y'all been hammering these dates in, and nobody said jack about 2001. Um, so a lot of these prophecy guys got on the bandwagon and said, Oh, yeah, I said it. Like, no, you didn't. No, you didn't. It blindsided everybody. And then I heard a lot of people, Hey, hey, wait, could you please just die? Just give me about an hour if you would die down. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, 
then uh, I, I heard people push it back to um, uh, well no man knows the day of the hour Maria because it happens to everybody individually it's not an event it's a it's a private epiphany but that's an, that's another teaching but um, um, then I heard a lot of people pushing it back to uh, 2012 uh, trying to connect with the Mayans prophecy that at the end of all things that happened in 2012 and now I've noticed that a lot of these guys a lot of these guys that were really um, prophesying this stuff back 40 years ago a lot of them have died off now uh, so I don't hear that many I mean it's not like I'm watching Christian TV but I don't hear that many of them really uh, set dates anymore now they've sort of moved it more to a political arena but um, my point in saying that is when you go back and read um, the very first verse of the book of Revelation, which uh, it, it clearly says this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's apocalypsis, the Greek word, which gets translated apocalypse, just means the unveiling. And it's not the unveiling of wars and destruction and Armageddon. It's supposed to be the unveiling of Christ. If you read the book of Revelation and you see anything but Christ in that, you're not reading it under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And you're certainly not picking up what John was trying to convey when he was on the uh, Isle of Patmos. He says, I was, on the, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day and this is what I saw. And it was all, it was a dream, it was an allegory. None of it is to be taken literally. Um, the, the, um, rule of um, hermeneutics is whatever whatever um, uh, type of interpretation you apply to part of the passage has to be applied to all of the passage so if Paul if uh, John was seeing visions of seven-headed dragons and and uh, large insects with human heads uh, you know the kind of things that he was seeing if those weren't literal then none of it's literal a lake of fire isn't literal a crystal sea isn't literal all of it is allegorical he was having a dream and he was trying to explain his dream and the dream if you read the first chapter of uh, the apocalypse he says I was in the spirit to reveal Christ to you and when I and two things I want to point out you know, when you go back and read uh, uh, these things that you've read for years, at least I do, I'm always finding Easter eggs in them. I mean, I'll just casually read a passage and I'll, I'll see a verse that I'm sure I've read hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times. And then something will just pop out at me and I'll say, well, you know, I've never noticed or I've never paid attention to that before, which is fascinating to me. But um, he says um, a couple of things that I want to point out today, and then I want to connect it with the um, Christmas season. But um, the first thing I think that's really interesting is um, when he sees a vision of Jesus. Now, remember, uh, the original apostles... Um, they knew a pre-resurrection Jesus. And Paul had a post-resurrection revelation of Jesus. Paul, when he was still Saul of Tarsus, he never met Jesus. And then after Saul was converted, after, you know, he was single-handedly trying to stamp out Christianity because he thought it was a cult. Then after he got converted on the road to Damascus, when, come on, give me a break, please. I'm asking you very respectfully, just just die down for me up here on this roof for the next hour. I would really appreciate it. Thank you. Um, it's not that it's that cold. It's just when it gets too windy up here, I think it's hard for you to hear. Um, but anyway, uh, after Saul's conversion, when he becomes Paul, he doesn't go to Jerusalem to be mentored by the original apostles. He goes to, of all places, Arabia, which is just, I mean, talk about 
this is beyond passive aggressive. This is like just making such a point to really, in a sense, uh, it's like he was giving the finger to the original apostles. Because, I mean, no wonder they never connected with him, really. And after three years of being in Arabia, it's like he didn't even want to hear anything they had to say. And part of the reason, I know I've told you all this before, but you need to hear it again. Part of the reason the Gospels were written um, was because the Gospels were written last. The, um, the, the epistles were written before the, the uh, Gospels. And part of the reason why is those original apostles that believe in a bodily return of Jesus in their lifetime, when they started dying off and realizing that wasn't going to happen, they they decided, you know, well, one of us, some of us need to write this down that can remember what, what Jesus was actually... Oh, good. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, what Jesus actually said, what he was actually like. And, and when they wrote the, the Gospels, it was kind of like... It was sort of like trying to set the record straight. Like we can't just leave Paul and his wacky revel his wacky Arabian revelation that cannot be the definitive word about Jesus. We actually knew him. So that's part of the reason they wrote the gospels. And when you put the epistles next to the gospels, they sound like two completely different schools of thought. And I'm not gonna go into all that right now, but I, I in my last book I'm a chapter on um, so, um, uh, what's interesting about when, when John says that he saw, he says, I suddenly heard this voice that was like a trumpet sounding and I turned around to see it and he said, I saw that it was Jesus. Now, again, he's speaking in allegories. However, he did not say that he, uh, I know, Brita, I'm sorry, I can't, I'm, I'm doing the best I can with it. Um, so, um, what was I saying? Um, I just totally lost my train of thought. Oh, uh, he turns around and he sees, um, he sees uh, Jesus, uh, but he doesn't look at all like how he would have described um, I'm going to go back over here. I'm going to try this. Okay, maybe this is better again. Sorry, I'm gonna get this said today. Maybe that's gonna be better. Okay, my apologies. Um, is that better? Thank you, Kia. <laughs> Natalie, you're my favorite. You're my favorite metronite today for saying that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a tough crowd. Anyway, um, so what's what's interesting to me first of all is that when when John sees Jesus, um, he recognizes that and affirms that the post-resurrection Jesus is um, uh, very different. You remember when Mary Magdalene saw Jesus in the uh, garden uh, where the tomb was? She didn't recognize him, and uh, for the for the uh, most part, um, okay. I'm gonna stop reading your comments because I'm I, I, I'm having a little bit of a struggle to stay on task. I mean, I appreciate your I appreciate your feedback, but just let me talk for just a minute and. Uh, because when I see your comments, I think there's something wrong. Uh, so if you can just hold off the discussion for a little bit and let me talk, I appreciate it. So, um, and even when Jesus would appear to the uh, disciples after the resurrection, you know, he walked with the disciples on the road to Emmaus 
for something like seven miles and they had no idea who he was and they were even discussing the scriptures with him. So, um, uh, that shows you that even when people are discussing the scriptures, they're not necessarily seeing Christ. And you remember when they finally arrived at their destination, they, um, uh, they did not recognize him until he broke bread. They recognized him in the koinonia. So um, that's interesting, and I've talked all about those things. But um, what I wanted to point out today is that the fact that John describes him, and he says, um, this being that I saw, uh, he had um, hair like wool, he had eyes like a flame of fire. He had feet that were like burnished bronze. He had a voice. When, when he spoke, his voice sounded like uh, many waters. Now, was that symbolic? Yes. But it's also important to notice that John didn't say, yep, when I saw him, he looked just like I remembered him. Just, the very fact that John, who probably knew him better than any of the other apostles, was willing to recognize that um, uh, there had been an evolution, and that when you know when people visualize uh, Jesus, you know, going to heaven to see Jesus, they picture what they think Jesus looks like. But when when John continues to describe him during the rest of the uh, the book, especially when you get to like chapter nineteen, he says. He, he doesn't even say his name is Jesus. He says um, his, his name is called Faithful and True. His name is called the Word of God. He has a name written on his thigh, on his vesture that nobody knows but he himself. And uh, so it's, it's nearly like in, in the revelation of Christ that John is trying to give really to these seven churches. The, the, when he says, I, I want you to write this to these seven churches, um, uh, to show you things that must shortly come to pass. Uh, these were these were churches that were actually being persecuted, and, that, and he wasn't talking about things that were going to happen thousands of years later. And I'm not saying the Bible doesn't have prophetic parts to it, but if you you know you should know if you follow me, I am preterist in my view. I believe that those things have been fulfilled. I believe that you know when Jesus said. Uh, some of you are standing here who will see this in your lifetime. I believe he was talking about the destruction of the temple in AD 70. I mean, it's just logical. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's not life in the scriptures. There certainly is. It doesn't mean it doesn't have other meanings for us. It just means when you try to literalize it and, and, uh, and, and lock it in and make it fit into dates and make it fit into geopolitical things, you always create this weird theological Frankenstein monster. The scriptures need to be rightly divided, not wrongly connected. And when you wrongly connect them and make them say something that those original writers wouldn't have even been thinking of, you always create some weird false doctrine that oppresses people. The gospel always sets people free. So the very fact that he's, that that John recognizes that the post-resurrection Jesus didn't look like the man from Galilee. He didn't sound like him. Uh, he was different. That's very important because um, so much of religion is resistant to change. Um, people, for the most part, they get they get a belief system locked in and it's like it's in stone then you know what i mean and and um i always thought it was very symbolic in, and interesting that um as soon as moses got the ten commandments in stone they he, he dropped and broke them and they were they imploded and the law has constantly been trying to do that even even this morning, I was reading a little bit of um, 1 Corinthians 15, where he says, um, the strength of sin is the law. Like, in other words, the thing that empowers sin so much 
is people obsessing over it so much that the when you talk about the goodness of God, uh, it actually changes people's minds. Even Paul said the goodness of the Lord brings people to repentance. When you yell at people about how bad they are, it just makes them feel horrible about themselves. It does not, it does not produce change. Um, so that's the first thing I wanted to point out about chapter one, but there's two specific things. Uh, one is in verse seven and one's in verse 17 that I want to point out. In verse seven, he says, um, he says, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye shall see him. Now, um, it's really important when you go back and look at prophetic language that was used like, like when um, um, Joel talked about the sun being turned to blood and uh, those kind of things. When when prophets used the symbols of sun and moon and stars and things turning to blood, they weren't talking about the celestial bodies as we think of them. And when um, when clouds are mentioned, clouds are, are clouds are representative of ancestors. It's why uh, the writer of Hebrews says we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Uh, he's not talking about physical clouds where. Um, you know, Jesus is going to come back in bodily form and, you know, every eye will see him. What this is talking about where he says, behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. It, it has to do with, um, <clears throat> I haven't said this in years, but I used to, when I was, when I would travel and minister, uh, especially this, this seems like a, another lifetime ago, but because some of the churches I would go minister in, I knew they uh, would have an issue with me not preaching a pre-tribulation rapture. That was like a big deal back in the 80s. And um, so when I would go into a, a place to preach, I would give this disclaimer. I'd say, look, you may have heard things about me, but let me say, uh, I do believe in a pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And when I would say it, people would look at each other and they would, I would see, you know, they were like, oh, I'm surprised. I didn't think you believed in that. And then I would say, now if that doesn't happen, I believe in a uh, mid-tribulation rapture of the church. And if that doesn't happen, I believe in a post-tribulation rapture of the church. And if that doesn't happen, I believe Jesus will come back in bodily form to the earth. And if that doesn't happen, I believe that there will be a cosmic paradigm shift where every eye will see him and every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Which... Like, I don't know why it was such a big shock to people when I started preaching Ultimate Reconciliation because I'd kind of always been... Get, anybody that was the least bit intuitive would have heard what I was meaning when I said that. Because that is what I believe. And what's interesting is... Yes, exactly, Avery. Yes, and. Um, what's interesting is in verse 7... He says, behold, he comes with clouds. In other words, he, behold, he comes through everybody's culture, through everybody's history, through, through everybody's mythology, through everybody's um, ancestry. I'm, I'm not going to belabor these stories I've told you so many times before, but if you can remember the stories, I've mentioned a couple of, a couple of instances that happened the two times I ministered in Uganda, where I was able to reconcile what those people in that country had received from their African ancestry and connected it with the Christianity that really came in and did away with their culture. And it was honestly, that was, I don't know that I'll ever return to Uganda. Um, for various reasons, but uh, if I never go again, I, I fulfilled the purpose in being there as a Christian minister, um, uh, honoring the African religions that would have been from that part of the world. I mean, Uganda is where the, old, the, the oldest civilizations uh, that have ever been found. That's, that's where the, the cradle of humanity is, is there around the mouth of the Nile, Nile River. 
So, um, when he says, Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him, it's very similar to Paul saying in uh, Acts 17, uh, In him we live and move and have our being, as some of your own poets have said. Uh, this is why every year at Christmas, I always preach the gospel through um, uh, It's a Wonderful Life, through um, A Christmas Carol, through A Charlie Brown Christmas, all of the classic Christmas stories, including Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, they all have an element of the gospel in them. The gospel is not bound to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And um, so when he says, uh, Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. And then it goes on to say in that verse that even those who pierced him will mourn for him and will beat their breast. In other words, they will see that his sacrifice on the cross, as beautiful as it was, was not necessary to a universal mindset. And, you know, whether everybody's ready to hear that or not, I can't, I can't help that. And, you know, if you, if you hear, when I talk about the cross being a placebo, if you hear that filtered through a religious mindset, that's something you have to work out. I can't, I mean, that's truly what I believe. And not only does that, I don't believe that um, disgraces the cross. If anything, it makes me, I'm blown away at Jesus's willingness to lay his life down on something that he himself said, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. I mean, in his own teachings, he had already said, now are you, now are you clean through the word that I've spoken to you? So when people say, well, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes were healed. No. Our perception of our iniquities and, transition and transgressions were, was purged. We were alienated from God in our minds. But the Creator asked as far back as the, the fall. Uh, he says, who told you you were naked? Meaning this is not a reality. This is a perception. But because you perceive this is what's necessary, that an angry sky god has to be appeased with blood, then I'm going to work within that system. Jesus came in their clouds because to that part of the world, they believed that innocent, the innocents had to die for the guilty. And whether it was a, a high priest laying hands on a, a scapegoat or whether it was some pagan's you know, throwing a virgin in a volcano. It's all the same thing. And Jesus said, it's not, you know, if there's any way I don't have to do this, but he had already said, now the God of this world is cast down. Now are you clean to the words of, that was already, as far as he was concerned, it was already done. Uh, but he went, talk about going the extra mile. So if, if you hear when I say that, if you, if you think I'm disrespecting the cross, you you clearly don't know me. Um, I'm saying when John saw it, he said everybody would look at the cross and they would beat on their breasts and say, we're so sorry that you had to go through that. Because um, if we had just listened to the gospel, we would have realized that if we'd seen you, we've seen the Father. And um, so that's the first thing. The second thing I want to point out is um, when John sees all of this, he says he, he fell at his feet as dead. It was just overwhelming. Because, first of all, everything that he was hearing on the Isle of Patmos sounded so different from what he had heard in Jerusalem and on the shores of Galilee. I mean, it was like the island was a real, there actually is a, an Isle of Patmos where he was exiled. But the island was also symbolic because he was cut off from all influences and heard something that sounded so different from um, uh, so different from what he had um, heard from Jesus' own mouth. You know, I say this all the time, and I think I think it just goes over people's heads. When Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say, I mean, there's nothing more radical than that. I mean, he did not, 
disrespect the ancestry, but he said that was for a time. He was not talking about the end of the world. He's talking about the end of certain covenants, uh, the law, the, the age of sacrifice, all of those things. And what's amazing to me about this whole thing is when John says, when I saw it, I was so overwhelmed, I just passed out. I fell at his feet as, as, as dead. And it says, he laid his hand on me and he said, fear not. Those two words, fear not, that is the essence. If I had to boil the gospel down into two words, it would be that, fear not. Um, which is amazing to me because the book of Revelation has evoked so much fear in people. Uh, it's even when, like, um, I was driving by some church over here the other day and they've got a sign out in front that they're doing a seminar on the book of Revelation and just seeing the words seminar on Revelation it just I automatically felt uh, I, it, it's it's weird how those neuropaths are so connected because just reading the title I automatically felt you know from my childhood like it's the end of things and um, you know the cross didn't do it we got we still got to have a battle of Armageddon and all this kind of stuff. And um, when he says to John, fear not, that's, that's huge. Because what he, he says, I'm about to show you things that are about to come to pass. But I don't want you to be afraid. And um, the reason that's connected to the Christmas story is, you know, in Luke chapter 2, when the angelic choir appears, it says that the uh, pretty much the shepherds responded like John did. Um, it says they were they were sore afraid, meaning they were just paralyzed with fear. And the angels said to them, "Fear not, behold, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people." And um, when when John says in uh, verse 7 behold he comes with clouds and every eye will see him that's his version of Paul saying all were lost in Adam all are found in Christ you've got every and all those words there's no nuanced hidden meaning that those words just mean exactly what you think they mean and the gospel is the gospel for everybody it's not it's not the gospel for the remnant. It's not the gospel for the chosen few. Uh, it's not the gospel that excludes people. And for whatever happens in our government or in the election or in our culture, um, we're always going to be working to make the world a better place. But in the meantime, you can't be afraid. The I think the main importance of Christmas coming every year is just to remind you of that message. Fear not, fear not. And John says, when I saw, when I saw who Jesus really was and how big the whole thing was and that Christ was bigger than Jesus and the concept of God was bigger than my ancestry and it took bringing me out to this island to be cut off from everything to finally see it. You know, sometimes you have to, isolate yourself from other voices so that you can really hear the voice of God. Um, the Isle of Patmos turned out to be a blessing for him because he says, I finally, I finally saw the big picture because as long as I was thinking of him as a man, as somebody who's Jewish, as somebody who's connected to a gender, an ethnicity, a nationality, I couldn't see the big picture. People, I'm telling you, God is so much bigger than you ever imagined. Love is so much bigger. Faith is so much bigger. The gospel is so much bigger. And I don't want to sound flippant about real things that are going on in the world. I mean, because they, 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 they totally are. But I'm going to tell you something. God's got you. And you're not supposed to live in fear. And after you've done everything you can do to fix the situation, then you have to let it go and believe for the best 
and and um, you cannot pray and worry at the same time. You can't walk in faith and fear at the same time any more than you can drive north and south at the same time. And if you're reading the Bible or you're hearing people preach and it's evoking fear in you, it's not God. It's this weird, um, not even facsimile, it's this weird imitation of, of something that that tries to sound spiritual, tries to... Um, take on the voice of of divinity but it's not the true voice of God this is how you know when God speaks to you in your own spirit when when you hear a word in your spirit and something in you just deeply relaxes and you're like you know what it's all good it's really all good then you've heard from God you have not gotten into denial you have finally heard from God if however Somebody gives you some scripture or some warning or some exhortation and, you know, makes you think, uh oh, uh oh, you know, we're in trouble. The world's in trouble. Look, I'm not denying that there's serious stuff going on in the world. Last night, we just watched the local news, just just the just the shootings of people and local news. I'm like, good God, what the heck is there one day when people aren't just shooting each other? Like, I mean, it's. Yes, it can be very distressing. That being said, he lays his right hand on all of us and says, fear not. And he says, he finishes that verse. He's, I fell at his, verse 17, I fell at his feet as dead. And he laid his right hand upon me and he said, fear not. Uh, I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I'm alive forevermore. Uh, and he says, I am the first and the last. And um, when I think about Christ being revealed to you or me as the first and the last, you think about that spiritual longing that brought you into whatever your... Um, uh, concept of God is whatever that whoever brung you to the party is that's the voice that will carry you all the way through I remember um, I've shared this before but it was it was significant to me for a lot of reasons um, I adored my um, my uncle Harry Meshagan he was um a, a, a true prophet and you know I've talked I've told you a lot of anecdotes about him and our whole family adored him and he he crossed over a few years back but I had not seen him for several years after I came out and one night it was the last time I ever saw him alive on, on this side and um, for some reason I was out at his house mom and dad were there and it's the first time I had seen him you know, since I'd made a public announcement and, um, and I'd already had some pretty serious reaction from some people in my family. So I had no idea what was, what I was in for with him. And, um, we were all sitting uh, at the table to eat and he says he had a, you know, a voice. I mean, his voice was greater than, um, I can't think of the who's the actor that does all the voiceover stuff Morgan Freeman um, his voice is like even even more than that and he says um, so he says to me uh, <laughs> hey Elijah Hakeem Adonijah I'm glad you're on here um, he says to me son I mean I can't imitate his voice he said if I have a word for you will you receive it and I said yes sir uh, you know whatever you have to say of course I'll receive it and I thought I thought well here we go he's gonna say something about sodomy or 
the end of the world or perversion or some of the other thousands of words that have been thrown at me from the Christian community. He's going he's gonna to say abomination. He didn't say any of that. He, he looked at me and he said, remember those first things you heard when you came into the ministry. Remember those things and cherish those things because they're the things that will matter to you now. And I said, is that everything? He said, that's everything. And man, I'm telling you, I was like, wow. Um, that, was, uh, that was really powerful for me. And um, when he said that, I was like, you know what? Uh, it was very similar to the feeling I had when I had a visitation from my grandparents that I've told you about many times. But when he said that, I thought, wow, that's so interesting. That's no, there's no rebuke in that. He's, um, the exhortation is go back and, go back and rediscover what you loved about, about the ministry when you first got into it, which frankly is what I do every day of my life now. I mean, I, I got, I did the mega church thing, which was not really what I signed up for. I'm very proud of it. And, um, it gave me a great platform to be a world changer, but um, those weren't the thing. When I first started in the ministry, those weren't the things that I thought of. Um, what I what I cared about the most was revelation. That's that's the that's the thing that means more to me than anything else in the world. Is when I hear. The voice inside me show me another part of God that I can share with other people that I know is going to make a positive difference in their life, that I know is going to help shape the arc of things. Um, it's it's like it's that ful fulfillment that comes when you're walking and you like oh this is why I was born this is this is what I'm here to do this is why this is why I'm here like nothing. It, there's nothing more satisfying than um, finding out why you were born. And uh, I've known I've known mine for you know most of my life. And now I've removed so much of the clutter that was imposed on me from people who didn't have a revelation of Christ. They had a revelation of law, and um, they had a revelation of. Uh, Leviticus they didn't have a revelation of Christ and now that I know that I can live my authentic life and walk in my purpose and live out the rest of my days making a positive difference I mean I know every day of my life I salt the earth and light the world I know it I mean people tell me every day that the stuff I say the stuff I write the stuff I post the things I, the way I interact with people, it makes a positive difference. Even people who don't know who I am, strangers sometimes will come up and talk to me and they'll say, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but, and they'll just feel better about talking to me. And I think, well, I'm fulfilling a purpose that's, you know, I'm, that's what I was born to do. And it's very, you know, that, that um, sound that Crystal makes when you, ping on it and it's like really fine crystal it's it's it makes that beautiful ringing sound it's like every time like bing I'm like ah oh, that's why i'm born so um what i want to give you from this is um uh, of course fear not but also recognize that God may be initially unrecognizable to you. Like you may start hearing God speak to you from other places. And the voice of God sounds like the voice of many waters. Um, it doesn't always sound like the Bible. It doesn't always sound like Christianity. It doesn't always sound like your tradition. Um, 
Many waters have many different sounds to them. Um, the ocean sounds different from a river. And um, in this Christmas season, for whatever's going on in your family or whatever, just don't, just don't be afraid. Just do not be afraid of anything, of anything. Don't be afraid of, uh, of anything. I don't even want to enumerate. Just um, enjoy your life. Um, enjoy, um, enjoy the presence. Um, I think that's everything I wanted to say. All right, I'll go read your comments. And um, I really want to see you next Sunday in the theater. I'll be on, I'm sure I'll be talking tomorrow night at 1111. And um, remember all the other announcements. If you want to give to the ministry, go to bishinthenow.com. It's super, super easy. And uh, if you want to give to me directly, I have all the cash apps. And I just want to do this. I know this sounds, I'm not going to try to explain it, but he said he laid his right hand on me and said, fear not. So I'm going to lay my right hand on this and I'm going to say, fear not. I'm going to do it again. Fear not. One more time. Fear not.